Recording. Start. All right, the webinar is live. Let's see, if we get attendees, there they are. Shoot. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. This is Jim Crispino with Genesis. I apologize for the late start here. That was a uh, user error on my part. We'll let everybody uh, trickle in here. We've got some people joining. We'll let them get set up and we'll get started here in just a minute or two. All right, it looks like the attendance has kind of slowed down. So we're at a steady number. All right, my name is uh, Jim Crispino. Uh, I work here at Genesis in the developer ecosystem group. So I work mainly with our developers uh, that, that use our platforms. And today uh, we're on our devcast. We have Travis Cawthorn from the desktop team in our Genesis cloud division. And he's here to talk about the Salesforce SDK. So we're really privileged to have him on today. And just some logistics before we get started. Uh, there will be a 10 minute Q&A session at the end of this uh, webinar. And I would, if you have any questions that you see as Travis is going along, I would encourage you to click the Q&A button on your screen and post a question. And we will answer those most likely at the end of the webinar. And also we are recording this. It will be uploaded, uploaded to our Genesis community YouTube channel shortly after this. And it will also be available through our developer portal, portal at developer.mypurecloud.com slash video. Now, that way you don't have to remember our YouTube channel, but you can get to it easily from our developer portal and then subscribe to that channel later. And with that, I will stop my sharing and turn it over to Travis so he can show you all the goodness of the Salesforce SDK. All right, Travis. All right, can you guys see my screen? They can't speak, but uh, well, so yes, it's sure, it's sure. Go ahead. Awesome. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. So hi, everyone. My name is Travis Cawthorn. I'm the lead software engineer for Genesis Cloud, um, Pure Cloud for Salesforce and client integrations um, teams. Um, today, we're going to talk about the Salesforce SDK. Um, So just a quick quick overview um, you know, of what we're gonna talk. We're gonna talk about the Salesforce SDK. So probably the big question is, what exactly is it? Um, we're gonna talk about client extension points, the Salesforce Lightning messaging channel, this SDK Rust client, and then as Jim kind of alluded to, we'll leave a little time, we'll leave some time for Q and A at the end. Um, so definitely if you have questions, um, you know, I'll try to do my best to answer them. Feel free to you know, hit the Q and A button, raise your hand and we'll, we'll try to get get those answers toward the end. So the first, the first thing is, is, what is the Salesforce SDK? So this hopefully this is the easiest question I can answer today. Um, and it is our extension points that we've exposed as part of our Genesis Cloud for Salesforce client. Um, this is the same client that many of you have today already. Um, we are, you can get it from the Salesforce app exchange. Um, it includes the standard Salesforce or peer club, Genesis Cloud for Salesforce client. Um, that is that widget that usually sits in your, your CTI container inside of Salesforce. What we've done is we've wrapped multiple different integration points inside of this singular app exchange package. These integration points are what we've talked about, which are those client extension points, the 
Salesforce Lightning messaging channel and the SDK REST client to, and what this will do is it'll allow you to have deeper integrations through your standard workflows um, to really have that tight integration with Salesforce and Genesis Cloud. We know that every customer has different workflows that they go through. They have different concerns and criteria to have a successful, successful business in a successful environment. And we want to enable that as much as we can. So the first one we'll talk about today is the client extension points that we've exposed through Salesforce. So these have been exposed through a by creating a custom Apex class. Um, you can basically customize how we parse and how we handle Salesforce object creation. Uh, the three, the primary three that we've exposed today are on click to done, on screen pop, and on save call log. These for most CTI vendors are very standard out of the box and sometimes hard to customize, especially, you know, that one that's on click to dial because that is so ingrained into the Salesforce workflow um, to have a very easily clickable number, but there's some challenges with that. And we'll, we'll kind of get that, go over some of that with a, the demo, but, you know, it's sometimes great to be able to extend upon that. And while Salesforce has it to where you can do custom click to dial, um, a custom click to dial events inside of Salesforce, it doesn't always handle things perfectly. And that was kind of, most of those are around the old, older visual force style architecture. And this is more geared towards, it'll work for any architecture. It'll work for lightning, it'll work for classic, it'll work in sales and um, console. So it doesn't really matter where these events are coming from. Um, you'll be able to extend, make them extensible here. So just quick overview on how these work is anytime these events are fired, typically in Salesforce, the very first thing we do after we've done our prop parsing is that we send our parsed information off to this Apex class. What this allows it for is for you to configure, maybe we parsed it differently or you want to parse it differently, um, or maybe you want to handle it differently. So each one of these has documentation inside our help, um, help documentation or help help site um, so that it kind of shows all of the uh, parameters that are extensible. But um, we'll kind of go over two of them specifically here today um, that are kind of the most powerful um, to mess with that are the hardest to actually kind of get at um, without using this extension point. So let's jump into the demo. So in here, you can see we have, this is a standard Salesforce instance, uh, nothing crazy. It is using Lightning. Um, so you can see that, you know, we have our Lightning utility application down here, which is our phone. Um, we have a custom one that will come into play a little bit later. But, you know, all of this looks pretty much out of the box. There's no visual force elements on here. There are no Lightning components on this standard contacts page. So you can notice when you click, click to dial, um, it places the call, right? So nothing too crazy. Um, it kind of does what you would expect it to do. Um, as you navigate around, um, it will change the phone number in there. Standard click to dial functionality. Got a page refresh from Salesforce. But you can see in here, you know, you can, it's pretty easy. So the first thing you'll notice is I'm clicking it, it's placing the call. But all of these calls inside of the Genesis platform are seen as what we'll call personal calls or not related to a queue or a specific workflow. So it's kind of hard to have scripts on them. It is, they obviously get interaction logs, but you don't get those metrics that you get for analytics. If you associate them with a queue, you can't see really control agent utilization at all. So a lot of our customers want to add that to a queue. And there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. And if you would go to new interaction, obviously you can easily add something on behalf of queue, but it's a little bit harder with click to dial um, because it just pipes it right through. So you can have it prompt so that you're always requested for that queue, but that's extra agent work. That's extra users work. It takes time, it takes effort. It can, you can cause mistakes, right? 
So sometimes that can be automated. If you have, if your users are kind of in a group that it's pretty easy to say, you know, these should always be on behalf of a sales queue and these should always be half of a support queue. You can kind of automate that. Um, so what we have is you can create a custom CTI class and extend these methods. So what I have here is it's just a standard Apex class that I created. Um, I called it custom CTI and it implements our extension point for click to dial. You can see the very first thing it does is it parses the data that we sent to it. That'll contain the phone number, that'll contain uh, the related to object so that you know that your associations are happening correctly or if you want to change those associations. Um, and then the next thing we do is we add a QID. And, you know, going back to that simplistic method of, you know, being able to predict where or what queue you want this to be on be placed on behalf of, um, I just call out to a standard Salesforce uh, method or another Salesforce Apex class that I created, which gets a QID for an agent work. Um, so that method looked up my user profile. It said, I'm a, I'm a sales guy. Um, so it's always going to put all my work on behalf of the sales queue. Um, it streamlines my ability, so I don't have to worry about it. Um, and it really helps prevent error. Human error is something that is hard to prevent um, in a lot of cases, but if sometimes if you can script it like this, you can kind of really narrow down on that and make it a much streamlined, efficient process. So I've created the class, but the one thing is, is these are all configurable by call center. So your call center, who you, agents can be divided up into different call centers, which can have different Salesforce functionality, which can have different Salesforce Genesis cloud for Salesforce configurations. And so we did that with the extension points as well. So you can see, I actually have two classes. I can select the one that I want for my user because my user is part of this call center. So I do hit save, you can see it's there. Like all configuration settings, it does require the end user to either have a page refresh or to log in, log out. Basically, it's kind of got to refresh its state. Um, but now you can notice anytime that I place a call with click to dial, it still, it still places the call. But now you can see I get wrap up for that interaction. I get you can see it's on behalf of my Travis queue, which is my sales queue. Um, and then you can have scripts and other components so that you can actually tie it in much more nicely to your standard workflow instead of having either taking time away from the, the end user to actually select the on queue or to actually have it um, to have a mistake happen to where it doesn't get associated. So it, make, it just makes that agent utilization view uh, much more powerful. It makes just most of the analytics just that much stronger because it's capturing more data. It's capturing the whole picture, not just individual components. If we go back to those Salesforce Apex classes, you can see that, you know, I talked about I had two. Um, here's the other one. Um, as you can see, you can implement multiple extension points inside the same Apex class. Um, which makes it fairly powerful because you can you can extend all three, you can extend two, you can extend none. Um, but what this what this does is, you know, this first one still does my standard click to dial says what um, what queue should this agent should I associate this work to, um, in case you just have a default queue. But I overrided the save call log, and this is actually a particular request request we've actually had recently, um, and we choose chose to kind of put this tutorial out there. Um, but the request is Salesforce has multiple different types of Salesforce task record types. Um, this isn't new. This is, it has been around for a little while, but, um, it has to be enabled. It has to be set up. It has to be configured. Um, and there's, if we would do a client side, there's no way for us to easily validate that and have proper fallback logic. Um, but through this methodology, you can actually configure the record type, save it off as that new record type, return that information back to us. To the end user, it looks the exact same, but everything's linked to that new record type. So it's super powerful. Um, and because it's defined in the Salesforce Apex class and it's defined in Salesforce you know, ecosystem, 
you can't accidentally delete that record type. You can't accidentally rename that record type to where it wouldn't work. Um, it would, it's all tied together. Salesforce has those validations in place, which just make it that much stronger from an integration standpoint, because you shouldn't be able to get to a state where, well, it worked yesterday, but it's not working today. So it just, it's about stability. It's about security. It's about customization and just embedded workflow. Um, for that client, for that end user. And like I said, you can have multiple and you can kind of divide it up for different end users, different, different agents. So the next, the next level of integration, it's still a client-based integration and it's utilizing the Salesforce Lightning Messaging Service. So the Salesforce Lightning Messaging Service is a communication channel that enables communication between the Genesis Cloud for Salesforce integration and other native Salesforce components. I know that sounds like a, a mouthful, but really this is very similar to what they've had in the past um, through uh, custom events and custom notification um, API, but it's fairly new for Lightning. This was just released as part of the summer release this year that went officially GA. So obviously we couldn't add it until then. But now that it's added, we, we have this ability. This is very strong integration because what this allows us to do is you still have your core client, you can mix and match what you're doing with, with those settings, but there's a lot of reasons you want to have that deeper integration. You may wanna drive actions from the Salesforce integration up. You may wanna drive, change the Salesforce view based off what the end user is looking at inside of the Genesis Cloud client. So you can do that with the Salesforce Lightning Messaging Service. This service, we've, we've classified the extension in two different areas. We call them events and actions. So events are, are kind of notification events that we broadcast off to Salesforce. We kind of group these into three different groupings of interaction, user action, and notification. So over the interaction events, you'll get normal interaction changed, interaction updated, added, disconnected, state change events. You also get wrap up notifications around over that as well. So that's, that's great because you can kind of change the UI or do even a wrap up countdown timer in, a, in the UI. User actions, a little bit more. So these are more specifically, what is the agent doing? How are they interacting with the UI? So this is, will include login and logout. It'll include status information changes, right? So if they change their status, if they go on queue, if they go off queue, um, these are pretty important for things of keeping, keeping in sync something like an omni-channel integration. Um, we do have an out-of-the-box omni-channel integration, but it doesn't fit all workflows. We, we know that, um, so we, we've kind of, made it so that for more complicated workflows, you can kind of tie into these events, you can tie into these actions and kind of build out your own that fit your current workflow. We also have notifications. Notifications are much more broad. Um, they include things like um, station change, um, notifications that are popping up into the end user, what, is, what view is that user on? Did they just open up the transfer screen um, so that you could possibly populate information behind inside of the main Salesforce environment? So they're much more broad, they're much more general. Um, most of the ones that we, we see used today um, are interaction and user action, but there are a handful of good use cases for the, the notification. So these are the events. This is not one-sided. This isn't just us telling Salesforce um, or Salesforce components what we're doing. We also allow Salesforce to tell us to do things, to kind of script the, their behavior um, through what, we're, what we classify as actions. So the three actions that we've exposed today are add custom attributes, update state, and update status. So through adding custom attributes, you can update the the interaction, you can decorate it however you'd like with additional data from Salesforce. So if they're clicking between screens or, you know, a common one we hear about today is, you know, kind of a priority level or is, you know, is this a 
a platinum customer or a silver customer or a bronze customer. And I hope none of you have bronze customers. I hope they're all platinum, but you know, you can kind of update and keep tag that interaction with additional data that can be used later for analytics or just as it gets transferred around for um, things like a callback. Same thing with interact update state, you know, you can kind of drive what's happening to the interaction. Is it held? Is it picked up? Is it disconnected um, from Salesforce? Um, it really allows for kind of some of those functionalities that were really only available in our scripting engine that's embedded inside the Genesis Cloud platform. But now we've, it's kind of available inside the inside of the Salesforce environment. So you can kind of drive that scripting environment or kind of that workflow there. This is really powerful for things like high velocity sales and those types of workflows where you're trying to click through, you're trying to validate things. Um, and we actually have part of the demo will we'll use update state to kind of drive um, a little bit of thing, a little bit of that interaction state. The last one is that update status. So I already kind of talked about with the user action, you can get information about that current user status when they change it and things like that. But that's pretty one-sided unless you have update state uh, status. And that both are really required for a powerful omni-channel inter integration, right? You have to be able to not only know what state you're in, but what state they're going to. You could script their entire, the agent's entire, you know, agent utilization view. You can have their, you know, their schedule kind of all be driven out of Salesforce with some of these events and actions. The one thing I will caution you guys, everyone on is that the user can still update their own status. So, you know, you do have to take that into account. Um, there are other ways to limit that um, inside the client. There are other extension points, but I mean, they can still always update their own status um, as kind of a fallback mechanism. So let's jump into a quick demo on this and let's uh, kind of see see what this looks like. So as you can see, this is our standard UI, um, nothing too crazy. I did add this component. This is a lightning component that kind of implements and exposes all of that data that I just talked about or some of that data that I just talked about. So you know, you have pick up, disconnect, hold, mute, secure, pause as kind of interaction state changes. There's also flag in there. So you can programmatically flag an interaction. Um, we have our update status. So you have break and available. We can add some attributes and then you can just see a long um, list of all this, the actual events that have been fired off by the client. So this is kind of just a sanity check or if you're trying to play around and figure out how to use um, some of these events, this is a great component, great widget that we have published out there on our GitHub. So as you can see, I've been taking phone calls and I've been doing stuff and it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, that's intentional. Um, just like we have with the extension point settings, they are defined on a call center basis. We also allow the extension points and how we broadcast them off to be defined at, on a call center basis as well. So you can see here, we've got a new setting called client event messaging type. We already had the ability to do some of this using standard windows.post message um, browser APIs, but you know, that had some limitations, you know, and there is some complexity with doing um, just the standard Windows post message API. So, you know, you do have to choose between the two. Um, mainly it's so that we can be efficient and not be broadcasting in both both locations. Um, it's not costly, but it, we want to be efficient. So you select which channel you want to use and you can select which, um, which channels you want, what event types you would want to be notified about. So by default, you'll have all three available. You can click select one of them or you can select none of them and that will obviously will be changed. For the purpose of this demo, we'll just go ahead and select all of them. So once again, we do have to do a refresh because it is the change to the, the call center settings. But you can see I have an interaction here. It still needed to wrap up, wrapped up. 
Um, I'll just say it's a really, really, really long replica. Um, but you can see some of that data is already starting to come across. Um, you know, I have that interaction ID because I already had an interaction on my queue, but I also, you know, I can change my status now. So it, it does work. Um, you can kind of see that as it's changing down there in the bottom left hand corner. You can also see the events that we fired off. So even though there's not that much happening up here, there's, there's quite a few events. So, you know, you got a login event. So if you're wanting to validate that they're logged in and if they're not logged in, show something in their Salesforce UI or put them in a state where it kind of forces them to log back in um, to make sure that they're, they're logged in and possibly available for interaction. So, you know, they're always ready and always available. You can see that comes across on the user action uh, categories. Um, you can see the routing status uh, was interacting because I had an interaction on my, on my queue or a conversation in the queue. Um, you can see just more information about here. So you can see me changing my status. Obviously, every time I changed it, it would come back and say confirm that it was changed. So it is very powerful. There's a lot of things you can do and probably will have a much cleaner, better UI than we have built out here or no UI at all. Um, and that's, that's kind of what we're going with it, with the, being able to script it. So you can kind of see this data comes across. If I place a phone call, it'll go out. I can mute it, hold it. Um, and then I can disconnect it, but it's kind of, it's kind of weird to go through that. And most of the time you wouldn't do that, but the power comes for with this is the scripting ability. So, you know, right now, a lot of customers are using the script inside of Genesis cloud, but you can, you can use the scripts and the workflows that are built into Salesforce. And one of the, one of the key use cases that we have here. Um, that we we implemented. There is an example out there where a lot of customers take credit card information. You know, it's busy time of the year, and when taking credit card information, you you don't want any recordings to be there. So you know, Genesis Cloud we have the secure pause functionality. We also have the request um, a secure IVR workflow. But if you're using the secure pause functionality to enter the credit card in through a widget or Salesforce or some type of form. It gets it gets pretty complicated. You know, the agent not only has to say, "Hold on, let me pause it, go back, take the data, remember to come back, unpause it, um, to make sure that everything's there." And it, it can lead to mistakes, especially as as they get busy. So, you can automate that for them. Um, you can make a lightning component that is embedded on a page, a form, or whatever. That anytime you gain focus to that credit card um, credit card input field you automatically send the secure pause over to Genesis Cloud. That takes the work off the workload off the agent. They just have to, you know, put in the credit card number. And then once they unfocus, send you stop the secure pause. That's super nice, right? They don't, you don't have to try to balance it. It removes the possibility of a mistake, an accident, right? You know, I, I was so busy, I forgot. Um, and it just makes it more secure. Right. If you can automate that piece for them and you can guarantee for, for your for your security audit or your compliance audits that you don't have any recordings of credit card, it just makes it that much more comfortable. So that's that's a big, um, big positive for some of these types of things. It's really it's not always about having UI elements on the screen directly. It's about how can you behind the scenes do some of the stuff to just streamline the process. They can always go in here and op override. They can, you know, do TTMF. They can, you know, they can flag the call directly. But if you have a field that, you know, or a status code that anytime you flip to it says, you know, call issue or, you know, whatever you whatever the reason is you're flagging, um, you could, you could automatically do that. Um, you don't have to wait for the user to flag it. And then that gives you not only reports inside of Salesforce, but that gives you reports inside of Genesis Cloud. Um, and sometimes those reports, um, you know, you, you have data in both places that show you different things and allow you to kind of slice and dice that information differently. 
um, to just quickly show um, So similar to similar to these, as you can see, like we're we're getting to the point from the client perspective, we want to automate as much as we can to really help those end users. Um, you know, either from the data that we're already sending through, and we're trying to automate to just what is the client performing, what actions are happening, and what can be done. Um, just automating it as much as possible. So everything I've shown today, we do have links on our GitHub and our help um, help documentation website. Um, so all of this is available. Um, obviously, we'll we'll post more links as well. But um, just if anything is interesting to you, you can dive in. You can see the actual code behind um, each each piece. So I've kind of talked about the client side extension points, um, but we also have server side extension points that are executed inside of Salesforce. And some of the reasons behind this is, you know, I was talking, I just said a minute ago that, you know, you have data in two different places. And sometimes that's good, sometimes that bad. Sometimes you want to aggregate that data into a single home and sometimes on Salesforce. So what, what we've done is we extended um, the client SDK or the Genesis Cloud for Salesforce client um, to also include the ability to make REST requests inside of the Genesis Cloud Platform. You can call basically any platform API that is not tied to a specific user's context. And we did this by exposing the get, put, post, and delete methods. And we also added a logging in there to make it a little bit easier so that you can do your Salesforce development, you have it logging, and you can also send those logs up in case it's tied to a, a Genesis Cloud support case. Um, to really kind of just give you that whole that whole cycle. These are the same methods that we that we've been using for the last couple of years to power our Genesis Cloud campaign management for Salesforce integrations, the Genesis Cloud email to case uh, for Salesforce integrations, um, and a few others. And what this does is, what's the benefit of using the Salesforce SDK? generated by us versus just calling straight into the APIs directly is we extract some of the complexities around it. You know, how do you authenticate? We, we handle the authentication piece. We handle the region selection piece. That's all done when you configure your client inside of the, inside of our configuration UI. So to get to our demo, we have kind of the shared settings section. And as you can see, you do insert a client, an OAuth client that has you know, scopes. It, has, it is a code grant, which is why you can't do anything that is inside of a user's context. And then you select the region. So now we know the region, we know the, the code grant, we can handle the authentication for you. And all you have to do is put in what you were else, what APIs you want to hit. Um, we deal with the headers, we deal with the parsing, we deal with a lot of but the monotony of making API calls inside of Salesforce and just kind of try to streamline it, uh, streamline it through the process. So I talked about a couple different a couple different use cases we already have today, but there's one use case that um, you know we have a campaign management integration today that we built natively. And that uses Salesforce campaigns and will sync that data across to a pure cloud campaign. And then that will maintain that, that relationship and sync it across. But we're only dealing with the campaign member contact records, which means that it's creating campaigns and it's calling people, which can be great. But there are reasons you don't want to call people. And a lot of times people will ask to be on a do not call list and things like that, which we don't natively sync today. You know, that's two pieces of information that may be recorded inside of Genesis and may be recorded inside of uh, Salesforce. And that's not great for continuity. It would be great if those were one lists. So using the standard Genesis REST um, 
REST SDK um, provided as part of the Salesforce SDK, you can actually have that synced across. So as part of the standard Salesforce user contact record, if you go to details, there actually is a do not call checkbox. Um, this checkbox is not visible by default, but it, you can just add it to your standard screen and you have it. So a lot of customers do use it, but it doesn't tie in with our telephony, which is pretty problematic. So through the use of a simple trigger and a, a additional Apex class, you can actually send this across. So this is the Apex class that we have, um, and it's a do not call manager. It's a simple class that I, I created fairly quickly for this demo purposes. Um, but you can see what it does is it builds the request to insert the contact record into the campaign do not call list. So we do have a global do not call list that we that I set up for this purposes, purpose, and it's tied to, you know, you may have multiple do not call lists, you may have a single do not call list. But you can take that ID, you can throw it in here and then add that contact anytime the checkbox is checked um, and call in here. So if you look at the actual request we have, um, you can see it's purecloud.sdk.res.post and then you do just post the endpoint and the payload. So you do have to configure the endpoint, you have to configure the payload. This is more of a developer, a developer SDK. This is this is there's not a lot of UI components. It's we don't have it's not click click a checkbox out of the box feature. It's a more indelled in integration, but you can kind of tie it to your actual workflow. So you can see once we we do that, we do also validate and make sure that we we select and update that record accordingly and correctly so that it is that that checkbox is correct. So if I go here, I click do not call, I click save. This record is now sent across to my, it goes through this Apex class, it is sent to Genesis Cloud, it's added to the Genesis Cloud do not call list, and then it comes back and validates the checkbox is checked. So now anytime that this phone number would be added to a a contact list, um, it would not actually, the contact list would notice skip it because it's part of the do not call list. We can show that Apex trigger. So that trigger is a very simple trigger um, that is basically just saying on update, we add the phone number to our do not call this manager. Um, obviously you can determine however you want um, what, what list to add it to and what, um, what list to add it to and when you add it. Um, obviously we used a simple checkbox that is already part of this native Salesforce uh, record, but you can, you know, if you had a custom or an aggregate field, the formula field that dictated it, um, you could tie it off of all of that too. Um, because there may be different con do not call lists that you have. You may have one for calls, but one for emails, right? Or SMS, since our dialer does support um, SMSs. So this is the one that's the most extensible, right? You know, being able to hit our, any API endpoint you have in here, like I said, this is, this is what powers our campaign management, our email to case integration. So it has the ability to be incredibly powerful to sync a lot of data over with our campaign management. We hit our uh, analytics APIs and actually sync that data over. 
so that you can see, you know, see the performance of your campaigns. Um, there's, there's a lot of functionality you can do here. Um, and the nice thing is, is a lot of it is behind the scenes, right? It's not, it can be initiated by a user action, but a lot of times it's initiated by a scheduled job or it's initiated by, you know, um, a record type being created or not being created in a specific way. So, you know, anything that you can do with process builder, anything that you can do with a trigger, you can basically call one of these endpoints, grab data out of Genesis cloud and use that data to make better routing decisions um, or better, better workflow decisions, not necessarily routing, but workflow decisions. And like I said, we do have, um, before I go too far, um, we do also allow for server-side logging. So we exposed our logging framework, which you know there's a lot of value in doing that because if you're running into an issue um, that is tied to our endpoints with um, our conversation IDs or with um, our correlation IDs, you can also, if you're using our logging, you can send it up to us and our support staff will have access to that information. But it is an opt-in. We don't we don't send it up to our support staff by default. Um, but you can opt into sending it up to sending it up and having it worked on as part having it on the record as part of your support case. So here are the additional resource uh, links uh, as well to kind of what I showed today. Um, just being able to do the do not call list, you can tie it into, you know, email to case and things like that. Um, and then obviously our help documentation as well, which allows you to kind of all of the, all the extension points and their properties are exposed there. And if you have any questions, it really has deep links to our developer forms and our community posts so that you can kind of, you know, have one kind of holistic look um, at the extension points. So kind of to recap, we've talked about three different areas of the Salesforce SDK. We've talked about the client extension points, which allow you to kind of massage the, the standard data and kind of how we use that data. We talked about the Salesforce Lightning messages that allow you to kind of do your scripting and your workflow management through the standard Salesforce UI and still have impact and keep everything up to, up to date and in sync with the Genesis Cloud client or Genesis Cloud Platform. And then we have the SDK Rust client that we've exposed. So, you know, it's a server-side extension that enables for a tighter integration and transfer of data with inside of the Genesis Cloud Platform. This, these are the latest extension points that we've done. Um, and the nice thing is, is because they're part of our standard package, they're available today. They're already in a lot of environments. We do recommend you have it staying on the latest, up to date on your packages as much as possible, because that gives us access to the latest features and bug fixes. Um, so try to stay up to date, but you have a bit of access to all of these today. So if there's anything, we're always updating it. If there's any ideas or things that you come up with, definitely feel free to reach out. We have community, we have um, kind of a way of submitting ideas and voting on it that you can also, you know, impact where we go next and how we additional features and functionalities we add to these extension points. Do we have any questions? Yeah, Travis, this is Jim. Um, we have a question from Marco, and this was back when you were you were showing the first client example where you had your class that um, encapsulated the three uh, on on uh, on click to dial uh, and, and the other two. I can't remember what they were, but he said it looks more like you're doing replace instead of extending of the base class uh, base methods said so is there a way to run the custom apex class and still run the original code um, with the original code hidden we don't know what to replace so it's more like are you able to create a custom class and then call the base class after it so the these are called after we've done our parsing um, so after we've already kind of parsed out the information that we have um, and how we would handle it, 
that's when we call these and it's kind of the last step before we we perform the actions inside of us um, so you'll already have how we parsed it you'll already have kind of the structure that we're in and some of that's documented in our on the the help center um, and we try to use you know the same names if we parse it as for you know for screen pop example we have the you know the url pop or the the search object you can kind of see that come across and you can that's where you would you could kind of interject um you can't see the base the, the base class and like yeah it is hidden um and how we how we kind of manipulate that but it's all still flowing through that kind of base class you're getting it right before we would take action upon it so you're kind of getting make sure you know we parsed it we have the data that you want us to to act on so in a sense you do kind of get to run the original code because for click to dial example you actually you just add and decorate the click to dial object with whatever you want and then return it and when you return it that's when we perform it so if you wanted to change the phone number parse the phone number a different way maybe we got the country code wrong right you know country codes are challenging and not everyone's not every customer's data is the cleanest uh, i would say most most customers have dirty data somewhere um so you know being able to massage that and you know you know if you're based out of italy you may be able to say my default country code for most of the time is italy but sometimes it's you know france um, so you can kind of get, um, make that assumption in your code and a little bit easier than us making the assumption in our code. Hopefully that, hopefully that answers right. That. Made sense to me. <laughs> hopefully it made sense to Marco. All right. The next one, uh, William asked several here, so we'll, we'll, we'll try and get through those. When some customers request about having the possibility of doing something else after the agent wraps up a call, it would be achieved by using the lightning message service, right? So I guess if they want to do something after the call, the message service would get an event. And, yeah, so and what I, you could have some Apex class operate after that, right? Yeah, so how I would approach it is when I would use the lightning messaging service and when they get that wrap up request event across the messaging service, I would change their status and I would change their status to a probably a custom busy status that is saying, you know, working another, you know, wrap up too, or, you know, whatever else they're doing. Um, that way that you don't, you're still kind of reserving that time to not get another interaction. And then you would get that event that the agent completed wrap up, you can do whatever they need to do. And then you could script putting them back on queue. So like, yeah, you're kind of working around our queuing mechanism a little bit, um, but at the same point in time, um, it would allow you to kind of have that extra work that's not, it's not gonna be accounted for under the standard, you know, agent workflow um, through the, the default report, but through some custom reporting, you could, you could get to that information. But I would 100% be the lightning messaging service. Um, I think I see the other one from William, um, which component throws the events. Um, so the events are raised via the standard client. Um, so, you know, if I jump to the UI, it is this client that's raising the events that you would be listening for. Um, the components that handle them that you would listen for those events, there, it really depends on where you want to put it. Um, it that would be a custom component that it, um, you built or, you know, a a developer would build and that could be in this similar to this component where it says part of the utility bar it could be embedded on an individual page um, so you could actually have you know a component embedded on the page that would allow you to see that see and or interact with data coming from the main uh, genesis cloud for salesforce client okay um, Travis, the next one, again, it's from William, uh, which component throws the event and which component handles them? Um, sure that's, that's, that's kind of what I was just talking about. Um, okay. Which is, All right. It's, it, we're the ones that are raising those events, um, and telling you, uh, telling it about the action about those events. Um, but it could be, the component could be anywhere. It could be a utility, it's just a lightning component, right? So that could be a utility bar, it could be embedded on the page. It can be popped out. Um, 
you know, that's, it's, it's very, very extensible. Okay. And then what are the common use cases that customers have done by using the REST client SDK? You talked about the do not call. Are there other, are there other common use cases you would use that REST client SDK? Um, you know, do not call is, is, is a good one. Um, syncing information about analytics or reports uh, back to Salesforce is, is also common. You know, pulling, pulling, it's, it's about pulling data and putting data back and forth. So, you know, it's, it's kind of about synchronization. Um, so, you know, that's, there's a, there's a lot of use cases there. Um, anything from, you know, you're onboarding a new agent, you could call the agent that create, create a new, create a new user mm. inside of Genesis cloud. Um, I wouldn't recommend that we have other products <laughs> such as skim and, uh, things, but sometimes they don't flow that way. Right. I mean, sometimes you don't have that level of integration. So there, there are endpoints that you can hit, easily hit, um, and use cases there. I think I saw Richard unmute, so you might have an idea there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so um, like oh, Travis ahead, mentioned, Richard. it's it's really sort of any point that you would want to be leveraging the the Genesis Cloud Public API. Um, so the collection of uh, analytics data from the analytics API to build out um, dashboards and reports inside of Salesforce.com. Um, if at certain points within your workflow you're wanting to um, schedule a callback based on a, an order that was placed, or you want to automatically send a, uh, a text message um, using the Genesis Cloud Platform. The, those are all things that, um, that generally you would leverage the, the public API to do. We're just trying to make it easier. So rather than having to figure out, okay, how am I going to store credentials inside of Salesforce and handle the authentication and handle my own logging, um, the SDK is really there as a as an easier on ramp to accessing the Genesis Cloud Public API from the Salesforce platform by exposing it as a uh, uh, as an Apex class rather than having you roll all of your own implementation and and deal with all of that. Excellent, thanks, Richard. All right, last one from William is the information of interactions handled in Salesforce can be traceable and will they be persisted in both Salesforce slash Genesis cloud databases and how, how those are related in database level. So kind of a long logging, I believe. And I know you said you, we can opt in to get logging sent to Genesis if they're logging in Salesforce that can be looked at and monitored. Um, from a from a logging standpoint, um, the logs are saved inside of Salesforce. We do not currently clean up the logs, um, so you know obviously that is on a per customer basis on how they want to, you know, phase out, clean up those logs, and you know keep their keep their system clean. Um, we do have we they, we do have a setting to say, do you want to you know have verbose tracing or do you just want to have error and warning tracings. Um, so that you have different levels of logging. Um, that's, there is no direct relationship inside of Genesis Cloud and Salesforce as of today, except for it having reference IDs such as interaction IDs and or uh, conversation um, uh, correlation IDs. So request correlation IDs from the public API. So those, those can usually easily be pretty much correlated, but there's no direct correlation from a database database level. Um, okay. To on, on top of that, um, you know, all interactions, if you're using interaction logging um, or call logging for the client, interactions are already logged inside of Salesforce. So there's already interactions in there. There's already interaction IDs. And through an interaction ID, you can already have a deep link or a relation to the, to the information inside of Genesis Cloud, which we don't, we don't natively delete today. So you, you do have relationships there, but I would say that, you know, from a database perspective, you know, there's no, there's no easy SOC query that you could come up with that would kind of pull it all together. It, it is, it is separate, but there are those, you know, relationship keys there. All right. And the last one we have, this is great because we're coming right up to the top of the hour. So Renee asks, you said that the Salesforce email to cases supported, does this also 
support to transfer attributes from Salesforce to Genesis Cloud? And how does Genesis make use of the attributes? Um, so that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so um, Salesforce in another case is, is supported. We, that is a, it is documented on how to do it. Um, you can do it via a trigger. You can do it through a process builder um, event. And you can add additional attributes on that. How you use those attributes is kind of up to you because you're the one handling it. Um, so when, for an email to case interaction, if you're using the email to case um, methods that we've already built out, you know, you tell us about it, you tell us what queue it goes to, you add, you decorate those attributes. Then once they get routed to the client, obviously we do some things with those attributes as well. Um, so you can have those attributes map to the UI so you could see that data here, just like you see just like you see, you know, the name, the status, um, the number in the queue, you can have as many custom attributes as you want in that UI. Um, so you could pull extra data in there. You can use that data to, to set those screen pop attributes so you can make sure you screen pop to the right objects. And that's through the standard Salesforce um, email to case functionality. Now, if you want, you can use the Salesforce uh, SDK that we've exposed. Um, and what that'll do is you'll actually kind of have to tell it what you're doing even at a more granular level. So we, we kind of wrapped those methods and made it a little bit easier. So it's guaranteed making an email, but you would actually create that conversation. And that kind of goes back to what Richard talked about a minute ago, where you would create, you know, you could do this to create callbacks, programmatically create callbacks from, from a button click or from a, you know, from a schedule. So you can schedule a callback, have it make that callback, put it on the queue and then have it routed. So kind of how you handle that data is, is hundred percent up to you. Um, the client obviously handles it specifically when it comes to the client, but if you're, if you're trying to use it for reports, you can obviously pump more data on there and then, you know, do more custom reports and things like that. Excellent. And with that, I think we'll wrap it up for the day. Um, Travis shared a lot. It's, it's all on the video. That video will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can get to that through our developer center at developer.mypurecloud.com slash video. And um, we will post the links that was in, that were in Travis's uh, presentation. We'll place those in the comments for that episode so that they'll be there as you're viewing the, uh, as you're viewing the video, you'll be able to get to the links really easily. So thank you all for joining. I'm sure everybody's got to run to the meetings that they're late for at the top of the hour. So thank you for thank you for joining. We'll see you next time. Bye bye.